All right, so we got 12 minutes to talk about happiness, um, particularly relational happiness. So um, probably three or four years ago when my, when my son, Ethan, was in sixth grade, um, I had a little experience with him that I thought was kind of interesting. Uh, we were driving back from the hub, our teen center, and he'd been hanging out with some friends there. And we got in the car and he said to me, Dad, don't you want to know why I'm so happy right now? And that's kind of a lead-in kid question, right, to let you know that you should say, well, yes, I do. So I asked him why, and he said, Dad, I picked up a girlfriend today. Well, I, yeah, and I have all these thoughts in my head about how I should respond, and I don't want to make too big of a deal of it. So, so I told him, I said, first of all, buddy, you probably shouldn't say picked up a girlfriend. You, you don't get them at Walmart. So um, let's come up with some different language there. But um, tell me about it. Tell me what her name was. And he said, you know... He said, we, we were doing so much stuff running around together, I never got her name. I don't know what it is. And I said, well, E, that's probably a bad start to any relationship. You don't know her name. And he said, it's no problem. I'm going to find her on Facebook. So we get home. He gets on his computer, looks on Facebook, and he, I hear him yell from the other end, Dad, I found her. We're going to have a Facebook chat date. So I got storm clouds forming over my head and all that, but I'm just going to let it go and happen. So, so he gets on the computer. I kind of lose track of him and I'm in the kitchen making some food, and it hasn't been 10 minutes So he comes in, and we have a door that separates our kitchen from the living room. He comes in, kicks the door open, big tears in his eyes, throws his phone down on the counter, and I say, Ethan, what happened? He said, Dad, she broke up with me. I said, I said how, how could this be? How could she break up with you? This, what happened? He said, well, she told me that she thought I'd changed since we met two hours ago, right? And he said, she also said that she thought we were growing apart a little bit. And then she also said her dad said that she wasn't allowed to date anyone right now. So it probably wasn't going to work out. And I told him, you know, in, you know how it is. In my head, I'm trying so hard not to laugh. But, but he's crying and he's heartbroken. And, and what it made me realize was this. It doesn't matter if you're sixth grade or if you're 65. Matters of the heart are complicated right? Matters of, of, of relationship, they're hard to deal with. Um, but, but what the research from Dave's book has told us is that there are some people who, when it comes to those relationships, deal with them differently than other people. But the other thing that has told us is that there are certain relationships that make us happy, right? Our hearts are central to how we experience happiness. And there are some relationships that are bound to help you be happy. So if we were playing Family Feud, I bet you could come up with the top three answers on the board, right? They're your family, they're your friends, and they're your love life. And what the research tells us is that those three relationships determine whether you're happy. When, you're, when those relationships are good, you're good. When they're bad, it's harder to be happy. But, but, but here's, what, here's what is interesting about that, is that those relationships are chaotic, right? There's no good way to determine how those are always going to go. I mean, think about it. Who can make you extremely happy and white hot angry in the, in the same 60 second period outside of those groups of people? Outside of the person you're married to, your kids, your family, your friends, who can make you feel safe and supported and then in the next minute feel completely betrayed? So who can do those things outside of that group? So what we found is that there are some people that have a way to rise kind of above that. In other words, some people have found a way to be happy in the middle of relational chaos. Their happiness is not dependent just on those relationships. Now, this is not a new, this is not a new concept, what they've done. But what we found is that they have guarded their hearts with contentment. The people who are able to rise above those relationships and find relational happiness, even if the relationship is challenging, are people who have guarded their heart with contentment. Proverbs chapter four, verse 23 says this, above all things, guard your heart, for your heart determines everything. Other translations of that say, your heart determines the direction of your life, or all the issues of your life flow out of that. What the Bible's saying is guard your heart, because your heart ultimately will determine if you're happy among a number, number of other things. There are people who, who have figured out how to guard their heart against things. Now, here's why this is difficult. And we're going to talk about what contentment is in just a second. But here's why it's difficult to be content in those situations. Contentment is not our contentment is not our default response when our expectations aren't met. You know what I mean? 
Like if your expectation for something is not being met, if, 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 if your relational expectations aren't being met, if you're anything like me, the first thing you do is probably not stop and go, wow, I'm glad I have this bigger perspective and I don't have to be angry. If you're like me at all, when your expectations aren't met, instead of being happy, you're angry, you're frustrated, you're sad, you're impatient, you're annoyed, you're any of those things, right? That's the way that we normally respond to any kind of, of expectation that isn't being met. Yet, like I said, there are some people who respond to these things differently. So the question is, how are they content and what does it actually mean to be content, to guard our heart with contentment? So let me tell you what it doesn't mean. Contentment does not mean settling. That's not what it is. If you are lonely and don't feel like you have the friendships that you desire, contentment doesn't mean that you throw your hands up and go, oh well, I guess this is my life. <coughs> if you are single, and you desire to not be single anymore, contentment doesn't mean you go on eBay and buy a nun outfit and just give up for the rest of your life. That's not what it means to be content. Contentment is not settling. Here's what contentment is. And let me, if you're writing stuff in your menus, you write these three words down. People that are content do these three things. First, they acknowledge. Second, they invite. And third, they believe. And I'm gonna unpack that in just a second here. They acknowledge, they invite, and they believe. And here's what these three things mean. First, they acknowledge where they are. People who are content acknowledge the situation they're in. Listen, the situation might be difficult. It might be hard to acknowledge that you're lonely. It might be hard to acknowledge that, that your marriage isn't good. It might be hard to acknowledge that you're single longer than you want it to be. But people who find contentment don't sweep those things under the rug. They don't pretend they don't exist. They don't they don't act like they're happy when they're not. Listen, fake happiness is not happiness. So people acknowledge where they are. But, but the problem that many of us have is we stay right there. So people who have figured out how to guard their heart with contentment, like the Bible says, are people who acknowledge where they are, but then invite God into where they are. So you acknowledge where you are, and then you invite God into your story right where you are. And then once you invite God in, the third step is you believe that God wants to help you change your reality. You believe that all throughout the Bible, if you read it, it tells us that God cares about our life and that he wants to help us change our situation for the better. So you acknowledge God's presence in your life, you invite him in to your situation, and you believe that he wants to change it. This is a process that helps people guard their heart with contentment. And this is not just pop psychology either. This process is actually found in the Bible. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 12, here's what the Apostle Paul says. Paul says, I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I have learned the secret of living in every situation, whether my stomach is full or whether it is empty, whether, whether I have plenty or whether I have little. And then he says this, and this is the part you probably know, for I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength, right? Here's what Paul does. He acknowledges his situation. Does anyone know where Paul was when he wrote those words? Anyone? He's in prison, probably naked, chained to the ground, hungry, beaten in the dark. He acknowledges his situation. He doesn't hide from it. He invites God into it, and then he believes that God can help him change it. That's what lets someone who's tied up in prison say, I can do anything I want. I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength to do it. So, so this is a very biblical idea. And, and, and maybe you feel that way. Maybe you feel a little bit like you're kind of trapped in a situation that you're in. But think about this. What would be different if you decided that instead of responding in fear or anger or hurt or frustration or impatience, that instead you would respond by acknowledging, inviting, and believing in faith that God would do what he said he was going to do. So here's what I want you to do. In your menus there, if you're writing down, or if you're just thinking of it in your head, identify which one of those areas right now you're having a hard time finding contentment in. Your family, your love life, or your friends. So think about those areas and whichever one you think is <coughs> hardest for you right now, jot that area down in your journal or get it in your head. And here's the question I wanna ask you. And this is what I want you to walk away with today. If God is with you, 
And if he wants to help you change your reality, if all of that were true, what's the next step you would take? This is the question I want you to get in your head. If all those things are true, if God was with you, if he has been invited into your story, and, and if he wants to help you change it, what is the next thing you would do in that moment? So I'll give you an example of this. I have a daughter. Uh, she's 17, almost, almost 17. Her name's Kayla, and I love her. She's incredible. We have a really good relationship, but I'd say we have a typical relationship for a dad and a teenage girl. If any of you have raised teenage girls, you know what that's like. The one thing I can tell you is consistent about the relationship is that it's not consistent, right? One day it's great. One day I'm not sure what happened. What, and, 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 and so I, I know a lot of people, friends of mine who are parents, who in that situation of raising their children find themselves going, you know what? I'm just gonna pull back. I don't know what to do. It's just too hard. The relationship's inconsistent. I'm just gonna wait till they grow up. But see, if I choose to believe with my daughter that, that, that God is in the process, like if I acknowledge where we are and I go, it's hard to raise a kid, and then I invite God into that process and I believe that God wants to help me change it, that God wants to help me make it better, well, then I'm going to do things differently. So when I ask myself that question, what's the next thing I would do if I believe that God wanted this relationship to prosper and that God had placed me in my daughter's life? Well, for me, then I'm going to invest. I'm not going to give up. I'm going to keep finding ways to do more. So whatever it is for you, ask yourself that question. And here's the truth and the reality that I want you to know this morning. If you've invited God into the process, and if God is actively on your side helping you change your reality, then your story isn't over. You might feel like you've hit a dead end, and because your expectations aren't met, it's done. But your story's not done. Your story's just getting started. And that's what content people figure out. They figure out how to acknowledge where they are, invite God into the process, and then believe that he'll help them change it. Great. For about two years, we ran Sunday night services at the Grand River Marketplace. And because it was a different environment, we always had to do different things to match. And one of the things we changed up was how we gave an offering. So instead of giving it in little buckets, we always collected our offering in this giant black pyramid. Just because. <laughs> it's really just a container. Don't let the shape fool you. There's a slot at the front. But we want to take space in our service to give an offering to God and to talk about why we give an offering to God. And we realize that sometimes talking about money can be uncomfortable and sometimes people feel guilt and sometimes people feel pressure. We don't want you to feel any of those things. But for us here, we believe in worshiping God with every part of who we are, with our relationships, with our vocations, with our time, and with our finances. And when I was a little kid, my mom and dad used to tell me out of the Gospel of Matthew that where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You ever heard that? Well, they told me that you gotta start, if you love God, you gotta start giving to God to show that you love Him. That's true. What's also true as I got older is I realized that there were times that I felt my heart going cold and I was feeling far from God and I wanted to get close. And in those seasons, I realized that one of the fastest ways to rekindle my passion was to increase my investment into the things of God, not just financially, but with my time, with my talents, with everything that I had to offer Him. And so what I learned was that sometimes giving starts out in obedience. You give because you're supposed to. And then giving matures into an act of discipline. You want to give regularly and routinely because you want to make it a habit and an integral part of your life. And then giving matures beyond discipline and beyond obedience into a joy. You give because you get to. And when giving becomes a joy, you realize you're not just giving money, you're giving everything at all times to all people, fulfilling the scripture that says, give to everyone who asks and everyone who has need. And that's the kind of church that we want to be. Those are the kind of Christians that I want to be, that I want my kids to be, and, and that we want you to be, because it's better. In the last couple of months studying all this stuff on happiness, we found time and time and time again, whether they called it altruism, charity, pro-social spending, or simple giving and generosity, if you can find something that you believe in and give sacrificially toward it, you'll be happier. And we think there's no better place to give than give here to God and to God's people. So there's four ways to give. You can give out here, you can give in the lobby, you can give online with your phone, or you can set up recurring giving. But we wanna take time in the service today for you to do that. Nobody's gonna look at you or make you feel weird. 
And then if you've already taken care of that, God bless you, that's cool. Feel free to just hang out, look through your menus, pray, etc. Cool?